Hey everybody, uh, this is Andrew. I am an advisor here at International TEFL Academy. We are going to be doing uh, a Facebook Live today uh, with our ambassador down in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, her name is Adrian. Uh, welcome, Adrian. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> or awesome. nobody. I don't know. <laughs> we are going to be um, chatting about um, you know, what Adrian's life is like down in Argentina, um, what the job market is like there, you know, what the living situation is like, um, just social stuff, really just going through um, yeah, kind of what it takes to, to go and teach down there and hopefully having some fun along the way, hearing some uh, cool cultural things about Argentina and just um, yeah, really getting a feel for what it's like uh, to teach there. So clearly it's a whole lot hotter there in Argentina than it is here in Chicago. Um, so in the it's in South America, it's the middle of summer. Um, you know, what's it like mm -hmm. in Argentina right now? Well, I'm melting a little bit, so sorry about that to everybody. It's uh, 31 degrees here, which translates to Fahrenheit about high 90s, but with the humidity, it feels like a lot, lot more than that. <laughs> So uh, you can get a place with air conditioning, though on a teacher's salary, they tend to usually be more without. So you rely on a fan, one of these guys. <laughs> there you go. Well, whatever works, whatever whatever works to stay cool. So we kind of wish we had that problem here right now. You hope, but, uh, storm, you hope for the storm to break soon so the, so the air cools down a little bit. Cool. Well, we're, we're hoping for it, uh, surely. So um, I guess before we kind of dive into um, some of the, you know, details about Argentina and kind of what we want to talk about, um, first, Adrian, just tell us a little bit about, you know, yourself, how you wound up in Argentina, uh, maybe a bit about your, your TEFL certification. I know you spent some time over in Europe as well. So uh, just a quick background of um, kind of what led you to this point, and um, we'll jump into it from there. Yeah, so I worked um, in the marketing field for 10 to 15 years of my life, um, and I decided to make a change. And so I decided to teach and live abroad. Um, my first place I went was Prague, uh, which is where I took my certification um, at a partner school uh, with ITA. Uh, and I taught there for two years, and then I decided that I wanted to work on my language skills as well um, and see other parts of the world. So I opted for South America, and what I felt like um, was best for me was Buenos Aires because it was said to be comparable to Europe, so it was kind of an easy transition. Now, would you um, would you agree with that assessment? Because I know I've heard that too. That um, Argentina is very European, and the the culture is very um, similar to to what you find in Europe. Would you did you find that to be true? Um, well, you know, I mean, the majority of them are of Italian or Spanish descent, and a lot of them actually hold uh, passports, European passports. Oh, so there is a lot of things that you can compare. I mean. The, the architecture definitely has an European flair to it, but uh, they're definitely South American. You know, oh, there's, yeah. the culture sure. is definitely South American. <laughs> the best of both. Yeah. yeah. Transition to Europe to Argentina, did you move um, directly from Prague to Buenos Aires or kind of what was it like, you know, arriving in Buenos Aires and, and when you first got there, how did that uh, play out? Well, I went ho uh, home to the U.S. to California for a couple months for the holidays. So I left Prague November-ish and then I got here in March. So I spent three or four months in the U.S. seeing family. It had been two years, so family, friends, doing the rounds, you know. Um, and <laughs> So for me, the transition wasn't really difficult. Um, the only thing was the weather change because I was, I kind of went winter, winter, winter. <laughs> and so now I'm adapting to summer. <laughs> cool. Um, well, that's awesome. And then, you know, 
when you get to a new country, um, I know a lot of people are always wondering, especially in South America, where it's it's not quite as structured, you know, in terms of your job and your housing and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, difficult to find somewhere to live. How long does that take? Um, I guess what's kind of your, your first step when you get there? Do you look for a job first? Do you look for an apartment first? Um, I don't know. <laughs> No, that's, a, that's a great question. So before I came, because I was in the U.S., I was looking for jobs and looking for work. And what I found was they said, call us when you get here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was one of those things where they preferred you to be already here. Um, and so what I just decided to do was I just decided to come down. I uh, got a place with Airbnb. Um, you can really get affordable options with Airbnb. Um, coming off the U.S. dollar, it was easy, um, and particularly now, it's going to be even easier if you have uh, U.S. dollars to rely on. So I had a few months of uh, U.S. dollars to rely on, so I just did Airbnb places, and it was great. You know, I chose to stay... The first month I chose to stay with a person who spoke English, <laughs> so I rented a room from her. And then the second t month it was someone who spoke a little bit of English. And then the third month it was no English. So that really helped me kind of transition into the language also and have help with that. That's um, awesome. And then, yeah, and then um, I just found a place on Craigslist. And now I live with two girls who are Argentinian. Um, one speaks English and one doesn't, so it's really great, actually, because it helps me with the language as well. Because you're going to need to speak some Spanish. Yeah. I mean, and that's great. And, I, you know, that's, yeah. that's usually what we recommend to people as well, you know, when moving to uh, Buenos Aires or somewhere else in Latin America, that you're going to find something short-term first, maybe an Airbnb or a hostel mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, until you find something a bit more permanent. And... Um, just like you said, you found it on Craigslist. It's not going to be all that different than apartment hunting here in the U.S. Or, or wherever you're from. Just might be in a different language, but you're still using the similar kind of sites and um, you know finding roommates with with people just like you would here. So um, I know it can be intimidating, but um, it sounds like you were able to navigate that situation pretty easily. And a so. lot of people do speak English, so you can find places where you feel comfortable and you feel like you can trust the person and have a conversation with them. So that isn't, that isn't bad. And it's also good maybe to get a temporary place. I mean, this is my suggestion because um, Buenos Aires is very, very big. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize. Um, it's big. <laughs> and depending on where you teach, it might be really difficult to commute from place to place. So moving, I lived in a couple different neighborhoods. I realized the neighborhood that I liked. I realized the neighborhood that was affordable. You got me. Hey guys, it looks like um, the heat is getting to Adrienne's internet there. So she'll be back on in a second. Um, so in the meantime, um, yeah, just a little bit more about um, working with ITA and the process of going to work down in Latin America. Um, obviously, you're going to want to talk to your advisor about putting together a plan. Um, as Adrian mentioned, this is going to be somewhere where you're going to be interviewing in person most of the time. So um, not going to be able to, to get a job in advance, as Adrian said. They like to have you there in person uh, before, they, before they hire you. So um, I think we are back on. So I was just... Hi. You're back? <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, you're good. And, um, I was just telling a little bit more about um, kind of the way you find a job in Argentina. So as you mentioned, they'd much prefer to have you in person. Uh, but to kind of switch back um, to what we were talking about, um, I think that's a great segue into kind of what your daily schedule is like. Um, so obviously there's going to be some teaching, there's going to be some commuting. Um, so uh, yeah, take us through kind of a uh, a typical day or a typical week, I guess. I imagine the days might might be different day to day. So um, tell yeah, us a they, bit about your They can be. So I'll tell you about what my last year was like because the school year goes from about March to December. So um, I kind of arrived at the right time and I got a job. That The day I looked for a job, I got one. <laughs> 
So, wow. you know, don't I'm start looking <laughs> if you want a job because you will be working immediately. So uh, that they have a really big need for native teachers. There's not a lot here, to be honest with you. So I don't think that there's any trouble finding work at all. Um, That's so amazing. Think, and just yeah. real quick for everyone. Yeah. Um, so, you know, believe us when we say, you know, it's not like that same hiring process here in the U.S. where you have an interview a month later, you have another one a month later, maybe they call you back. No, I mean, if you you can expect to find work very quickly, you're interviewing Wednesday for a job that starts Monday. Um, yeah. That is the, the, the fact of the matter. So um, yeah. thanks for that. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going. No, no, that's OK. And the only difference would be is that if you come during a low point or you come late in the year, but I know people who came later in the year and still got work immediately. I mean, there's always need for private tutors, things like that. So um, so I teach mainly for one institute, which is focused on business students. Um, so I teach in what is the micro centro area, which is where all the businesses are. So I was really lucky that I had almost zero commute. So basically, my schedule Tuesday through Thursday was I was walking five to 10 minutes from office building to office building. So Amazing. yeah, it was really good for me. Um, and you know, I think the importance of when you do teach in this fashion, that you are very honest with yourself about the time it takes to get from lesson to lesson and the benefit of your time and don't be afraid to say no to things that are going to take you across the across the city because it's going to just not benefit you so i mean i think sometimes we get nervous being teachers that we need to immediately take that that class or that lesson but i think sometimes you do yourself a disservice not building your lesson frame in a good way because yeah. if you build no. it well you can work consistently and 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 smart <laughs> yeah no i think that's i think that's great advice um because mm -hmm. you know just like you said, people get there they're worried they're not going to have en enough work so they just take anything and they end up traveling you know uh, a one hour commute there and back um you know for for a lesson that pays you know whatever it would be for one hour which might not be yeah. worth it so I think that's, um that's really really good advice and um just another another point that you know there is enough work to support yourself um, in these places as long as you're being diligent and following through with it. So um, Absolutely. it's encouraging to say that, that you're, you're finding work so easily. Yeah, and then so what I'm also doing, just to segue into what I'm also, I'm not just teaching business students because some people might, that might not be of interest to them. Um, but what I'm also teaching is I also work for a small institute called Mini Bilinguals, and it's a group where she does children. So you go to their home, and you private tutor the children. Um, and she's always looking, I know she's always looking for new native teachers and she's really great and definitely like pays on time and is really helpful for her teachers and all of these things. So um, I also teach children. So I have a really interesting mix from <laughs> 70 to seven, you know, so. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And you do a bit of teaching online as well um, to kind of fill in the gaps yeah. there? Yeah. And that's kind of basically I do that on Mondays and Fridays. I have some students from the Czech Republic that I now teach online. So they were my students for two years before. And so now I'm teaching them online. And which is also like an awesome experience, I think. And I think that people are often really hesitant to do the online thing, students in particular. Um, but I think that, as you can see, you and I are talking here through video. Um, and I think that today it's really good for people to experience this and learn to communicate through video because I think it's something that's happening with our world. <laughs> so, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I would totally agree. And I think it's, you know, as technology gets better and better and the internet's, you know, fast most of the time, it, it is actually an effective way to learn and to teach. So um, it, it's something that's very flexible. And, you know, regardless of where you're living or, um, you know, what kind of teaching you, you like to do, I think there's going to be, um, you know, a place for online teaching, you know, for, for almost yeah. every teacher to kind of fill in the gaps there and, and get that experience. So that's awesome. 
Um, so yeah, so kind of back to your your typical days. Um, you do all different kinds of teaching, which is amazing. I think that's sort of a common theme with you know traveling English teachers is being able mm -hmm. to piece that together. But um, so you you were talking a bit about your commutes and um, going from one job to the next. Um, do you work for multiple schools or multiple um, things in the same day? Is that common for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Mondays I work for one the mini bilinguals. I work for myself, and then I work for the other institute. So I really only work mainly with one institute because I find that it if you put too many companies into the mix, it just becomes a lot of work for you as a teacher with um, timesheets and things like this. So I like to focus with one school that I can be loyal to. Personally, that's my choice. Um, but so I have a, a, a business school, a child school, and then myself. And so I work on under those three umbrellas. Um, that's awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> You know, I know when I'm when I'm describing uh, the life, uh, the potential life that you can have teaching down in in South America and piecing mm -hmm. together the schedule. I mean, that's it. So um, yeah. it's so nice to to just actually get to talk to someone who's living it um, and who's putting it all into action. So that's great. Um, now I know it's um, something that most people are probably wondering about, and that's um, the money that comes with teaching. So um, mm -hmm. you do three different kinds of teaching jobs. Um, is the pay similar? Um, is it better um, teaching adults or children or online? Or, or let's talk a bit about, um, you know, the money side of things. No, that's a really good question. And um, my experience is, and this is my experience from the Czech Republic to here, because I've taught the same way in both these places. Um, at this point, I like the flexibility of it. I like the fact that I can manage my own schedule. Um, so I taught this way in the Czech Republic and I taught this way here. So financially, you're always going to do better doing private students directly. You're in control of the cost, the charge. You charge your students what you want to. There's no overhead. You go to their house or a cafe, the overhead is maybe a cup of coffee. So that's where you're going to, of course, probably make the most amount of money. Um, the reliability there decreases, right? Mm -hmm. So when you work with an institute, you have reliability. You're going to have those classes every single week. They're going to pay if they, there's no show within 15 hours of cancellation. Um, so there's that benefit. So I found that like a mix of the two kind of keeps you even. <laughs> Right, you have the reliability of an institute, and then you have the freedom and higher pay of working for yourself. Um, so that's worked for me, and I've definitely made enough to be able to pay my bills and travel occasionally. And um, you know, I spend my money. I don't spend my money on air conditioning. <laughs> I spend <laughs> my money on travel. So it's all about our priorities, right? Uh, yeah. I think most of us here. Uh, that do this job, our priority is always travel. <laughs> so that's where we all usually spend our money. But <laughs> No, that's the truth. I mean, you know, you're not going to get super rich being an English teacher. Um, you know, it's, it's more about the experience and, and yeah. just, you know, making enough to support the lifestyle that you're hoping for. And I think, um, you know, that that's really great. And just real quick, before we jump into to some more lifestyle stuff, um, yeah. you said you spent some of your money on travel. I feel like this is a good opportunity to talk about a trip you just took that um, over to, to Costa Rica. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Did it have any visa implications? Um, yeah, let's, just, let's talk about that for a couple minutes. Yeah, so the visa situation here is you're going to be working on a tourist visa. Um, I knew a teacher who was even teaching at an elementary school, and she was outside of the city, and she was on a tourist's visa as well, which meant she had to come to Buenos Aires, leave the country, come back. Um, I know this is something that I think bureaucratically maybe eventually they're going to work on, but right now I haven't seen another opportunity for it. Um, I personally prefer to be in a comfortable place on a on a on a working visa but it doesn't seem to be a possibility here um, so I have to leave every three months so some I <laughs> I made some mistakes I had a learning experience I went to go 
get uh, an extension on my visa because I knew my travel was going to be beyond the 90 days you're allowed. Um, and it's called a prorogar, which means to, to extend your visa. And I read the website and I didn't have enough money, so I had to go back and forth to the immigration office a couple times. Um, and she finally just told me, just pay your fine at the airport. So I said, <laughs> okay. So off I go to Costa Rica, thinking it will be easy, but it wasn't as easy. It was half my fault, half the airline's fault, but I ended up missing my flight. But all you oh, have no. to do is actually pay the fine, which actually is only about $110 in US dollars um, to for the fine for staying over your visa. But in pesos, it's quite a lot of money. It's almost like half of my rent. So you probably you want to make sure that you make that travel every 90 days. But they were cool with it, and I paid the fine. I got on the airplane. They, the airline actually apologized and put me on the plane the next day, and everything was good. It was a learning experience. But I do, I do want people to know that you know there sometimes bureaucratically there are some challenges here because you're reading it in Spanish it's not really very clear and in fact even the visa lady told me it wasn't very clear that they have that problem on a regular basis people showing up with not enough money to to extend their visa mm -hmm. so it, this was my experience with it but when i came back in um the immigration officer looked at it and she said you can't be here longer than 90 days next time and i said never again <laughs> like <laughs> i learned my I learned my lesson there. So yeah. Um, yeah, so sometimes there's some challenges, but generally they're pretty um, relaxed and understanding with the process and they're kind of used to American uh, tourists coming and going here. So that was my experience with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's, that's good. It's a great story because um, it can show you what can happen, you know, and even if things yeah. go wrong, you overstay your visa, you miss a flight, all this stuff happens. Usually it's as simple as don't do that again and you're on your way, you know? So it's not a huge deal even if something does, you know, go a little bit wrong. So um, I hope that alleviates some of, some of y'all's concerns about- Yeah, well, um, I mean, I think that those are kind of like- are for, Oh, sorry, we're talking for me. Oh, we good? Can you hear us okay? Okay, it looks like uh, we might have another uh, quick internet connection. So, or excuse me, uh, disconnection, I guess. Um, so yeah, to, to speak a bit about um, the visas in Argentina again, um, you're on a 90 day tourist visa init initially. Um, so you're not gonna get a work visa. Um, like you know, Adrian has said, it's, it's very easy to get hired. It's not gonna affect um, your ability to get hired at language schools, not having a work visa. Um, and then ultimately when you go on your border run, which they call it just cross <laughs> over to another country, come back. All right, Adrian's back. Um, just talking a little bit about the visa situation. Um, so yeah, so you know, every 90 days you'll have to renew that. Um, Adrian ran into some trouble, but you know, it really normally is, is no problem at all. So you can keep renewing that every 90 days um, and you'll, you'll be totally good to go. So, um, okay, so let's get back to the, the lifestyle part of it. You're able to travel to Costa Rica. I hope that was a great vacation. Um, it was back <laughs> Okay, great. Um, and back to so kind of your lifestyle in Argentina. Um, let's talk, you know, get away from some of the, the teaching stuff. And um, what are some of the great social things and cultural aspects of, of Buenos Aires that you love? Um, I know it's real hot in the summer now, but just kind of, you know, day to day <laughs> is really nice and things you enjoy about living there. Yeah, but I mean, even though it's hot, there is reprieve, you know, and most of the institutes and offices have air conditioning. I think we might have lost her one more time. So hopefully this is the, the last time that'll happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, the culture down in South America is incredible. So, you know, if you want to practice your Spanish and um, sort of be in that really lively, welcoming, um, just The warm Wi-Fi here during the heat, sometimes <laughs> some struggles. No, it's okay. And I'll, and I'll pass it back on to you. Uh, or maybe I won't. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, I know Adrienne's taught in both Europe and Latin America, so she's um, no, kind of got to experience both of those things. Okay, um, okay here we're back. Um, 
so yeah, your lifestyle in Argentina, um, some things you enjoy to do. This is a great city for just a social life in general. Um, there's always events happening. Uh, the restaurants are awesome. There's bars and restaurants and dances and everything that you want to do, really. I mean, there's amazing art. There's amazing museums. You know, it's a big city with a lot of really cool things to do. I mean, one night you might go salsa dancing and do a lesson, and then another night you might go have dinner with friends. And um, one of my friends tonight, she's actually got a job teaching in Thailand, so we're going to have a little fiesta and say goodbye to her. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, as far as personal life goes, it's unlimited yeah. things to do here, really. I mean, yeah. it's really it's really a fun social city. That's Definitely. great, and then that's kind of what you hear. I think when you see you pic see pictures of people, it's people dancing, people having fun out um, on the streets or in restaurants, and, and that's awesome. Um, yeah, and quickly there's too, a lot of life here. There's a lot of life. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, that, that's amazing. And so your friend is going to teach in Thailand. I think that's um, amazing. I just want to touch on that. I know it has nothing to do with Argentina, but you can yeah. see the life of a traveling English teacher. I mean, you can be bouncing from South America to Asia to Europe. It's, um, you know, that's extremely possible for people. So um, if you want yeah. to see the world, become an English teacher. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And she's a new teacher and she came here to Argentina but to teach, but actually ended up deciding to take a position in Thailand um, because oh, she had been working there for a couple months. Yeah, and I mean, the coolest thing is everybody going tonight, I mean, there's a Brazilian, there's an Argentinian, there's uh, an American from New York, there's a person, you know, there's, it's like the biggest group of people and it's really exciting because you go and you speak a lot of different languages and you learn so many different things and it's really, it's really an amazing experience. Well, and that, that multicultural melting pot of, of people is, you know, that's what it's all about. So um, mm -hmm. I know for me, that's something I enjoy is meeting new kinds of people from different backgrounds. And, um, you know, I, I feel like Buenos Aires is a very sort of international city, whether it's people from South America, Europe, you know, wherever. So that's, um, it sounds incredible, really. Yeah, yeah it is. So, how's the food in Argentina? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Though I will say, I will say, I do have one complaint, and that's their lack of hot sauce here. <laughs> ah, yes, I, from what I hear, they're kind of kind of babies when it comes to spice. Yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of spice in their food. Um, yeah. But you know, the, honestly, like the food is amazing. I mean, you can't say bad things about empanadas. You can't say bad things about I don't know. You know, for those people who don't eat meat, I eat meat on a limited basis because I believe that it should be a special occasion kind of thing. I don't think that we should eat meat every day. That's my personal standpoint um, because of the implications on the environment. But um, I do love a good steak, and <laughs> this is the place for it, I have to tell you. I mean, the, it's not, it, a, you know, a glass of Malbec and a and a big thick lomo it's pretty pretty amazing so <laughs> no i know that's what when you think of argentinian food that's exactly what i think of is empanadas and a nice piece of red meat with some red wine and um it's nice to hear it lives yeah. up to it because that's i mean they who doesn't like do that of, they also do a lot of pizza here and their pizza is really amazing and they have some really special pizzas that are um that are kind of special to this place that I've never heard of in anywhere else in the country. No, the food here is delicious. Yeah, awesome. can't go wrong. It's probably some of that Italian influence shining through there with all the pizza. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so you know, I think we've had a, a pretty good conversation um, about um, you know most of the sort of things that most people will consider going to Argentina. A couple other things that I or just something else that I wanted to um, touch on before we, you know, wrap things up is, um, you know, from a from a female's perspective, traveling uh, by yourself down to South America, um, yeah. people might be concerned about their safety or just, um, you know, being a solo female traveler. Um, could you address maybe some of those concerns that people might have or just talk a bit about your experience and how comfortable you felt with everything? Um, I know you've done quite a bit of travel already, but just 
Um, kind of speak to, to that perspective a bit. No, absolutely. I mean, I think this is a really important point today. In fact, when I was in Costa Rica at the hostel, I met three girls who were traveling Central and South America alone. And, you know, I, I was, I'm just impressed by the amount of women that are deciding to go and be free and make their own choices. And I think it's really wonderful. And I think, yeah, there's often the fear of safety, but I actually asked each and every one of them. One of them had been in Ecuador for 30 days alone and she's 22 and little. And I said, were you ever afraid? And she said, I never at any point felt uncomfortable ever. So no, I, um, I you know, I think that there's, that's not saying that the world is a perfect place and there's nothing to be concerned about because I mean, I think we all know the truth of that, but as long as you're vigilant and careful and have backup plans, um, I think that, I think that it's, I never feel uncomfortable, you know, I feel like. I would in as in the U, as safe in the U.S. or as safe as I am anywhere else. I I haven't had an issue, and you know I've talked to a lot of women who travel alone, and they they say the same thing. So I think that you know a lot of that is ideas that have been put into people's heads about the fear of what is the unknown. But um, I I I think it's I think go for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. No, I mean. Great, it's really nice to hear that, you know, and it's, you know, I think, you know, everything that you just spoke to and just, you know, having an awareness about you when you're in certain situations is, is going to be important no matter where you are in the world. If you're a guy or a girl, it's just um, just sort of being aware of your surroundings and not putting yourself in, in situations that might be uncomfortable. And it's, um, you know, and I think that whole idea of um, the unknown and, oh, maybe South America, it's, it's not quite as safe. I mean, you know, it's the same in any big city here in the U.S. too. So I think um, absolutely, just, you know, on and just going for it is is great advice. And you'll find that people are friendly all over the world as long as you treat them well and uh, are respectful. So I think that's a a huge part of it as well. And um, no, I, that's a that's a great perspective, and I appreciate you sharing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, and then last thing, um, just to ask you real quick, you don't have to go too much in depth about this. Um, the difference between teaching in Europe and teaching in South America. Um, I know you have experience in both, so I, I want to take the opportunity to ask you while I got you here. Um, just a quick minute or two on the main differences between um, teaching in, uh, in Czech Republic versus Argentina. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the biggest difference, obviously, from a language perspective is the fact that Spanish is much closer to English and I think they have a lot more um, interaction and um, exposure to the English language than maybe the Czechs have because of their history of communism and isolation and these sort of things. So I think um, English for the Czechs was sometimes a little bit more of a challenge um, because there's such vast differences. Um, and also, uh, I found that uh, Czech students, I don't know if it's maybe the way the education system there works or what, but they have less of a likeliness to just speak. <laughs> so a lot of what I did was, um, was definitely encouraging them to speak freely and uh, encouraging fluency. Here, it's kind of the opposite problem where you're like spending a lot of time being like, okay, let's bring it down. <laughs> let's focus. No, but I mean, it's yeah. wonderful. Like, you learn so much about your students and they're so willing to speak and so willing to share about what's going on and their opinions of what's happening. And so that's the biggest difference that I've seen is from a language perspective, it's a little bit easier for them to jump to fluency because of their willingness to just make mistakes and they're willing, and and the closeness of the language. I think the 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 comparability of Spanish to English. Cool, awesome. Well, that's a, also a unique perspective for all you people who are hoping to do a little globe trotting and teach in multiple places. Um, yes. You know, take that uh, advice. Um, real quickly, want to quickly plug our ITA Film Festival. Uh, this is something that will be happening uh, in April. Um, there's two weeks left. Uh, to submit videos for our ITA Film Festival. So February 15th is the deadline. Um, it will take place, like I said, here April 4th in Chicago. Um, Going to be an awesome event. So all you uh, video people out there, 
feel free to submit um, entries into our film festival. There's going to be some awesome prizes and some uh, recognition there as well. So um, again, we are with Adrian here, who's teaching down in Buenos Aires. Adrian, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, yes. A lot of unique perspectives, lots of great information. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. I hope you can stay cool uh, the rest of the day there. Um, but truly, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, and uh, we appreciate everything you're doing as an ambassador and, um, you know, you. just as alumni. So, um, I appreciate yeah, everything. You, I appreciate everything. Appreciate everything you guys do for the community. Really, I mean, I think that um, as teachers, I think it really feels good to have a community when you're so far away from your community. And I and I appreciate what you guys do for that as well. So. Absolutely. And it's, you know, that's what it's about. We're one big traveling teaching family here. We love engaging with our alumni and, um, yeah. you know, sort of introducing people. I know um, hopefully we'll have a meetup sometime in the next couple months down in Argentina, uh, maybe yeah. get some of our other alumni out there and really just um, kind of show some love and, and, you know, get together with uh, like-minded people and, um, you know, and have some fun. So again, Adrian, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it's been a pleasure and uh, we'll see you guys later. Ciao. <laughs> oh.